Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today are Kathy and Mackenzie Feldman, authors of Ground Bakers, Changing Our Food System. Welcome, Kathy and Mackenzie. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. So tell us why you decided to write the book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, growing up, uh, my mom raised us in a really healthy way. Um, mom, maybe you can start by t talking a little bit about your background and uh, how you became vegetarian. Well, I became a vegetarian in high school, actually. And um, just the thought of eating animals didn't really agree with me. And I just really wanted to become a vegetarian early on. So in high school, maybe 12th, 11th or 12th grade, I started just cooking my own meals, knowing really nothing about nutrition and balancing my meals, but just knowing that I definitely didn't want to eat animals or meat. And um, I carried that through through college and um, later in life. And then when I got married, I, I actually married a very heavy meat eater, local <laughs> from Hawaii, and he he did eat a lot. He came from a family that ate a lot of meat. So, but um, I just continued on my journey and would always make little separate meals. And then having kids, we decided not to put any restrictions on their diet, just cook healthy meals, uh, which I tried to do mostly vegetarian, but I did, you know, I never uh, restricted them in any way from eating pepperoni pizza or anything they really wanted to eat. And so, um, the kids grew up uh, actually incorporating meat in their diet until, uh, Mackenzie, why don't you talk about your college experience? Yeah, and, and even just, you know, so that's how we were raised. Um, it, we were able to eat everything, but my mom really emphasized healthy eating. We didn't have a lot of processed foods in the house and things like that. And when I was in high school, me and my mom really got interested in the pesticide issue in Hawaii. Um, you know, there was a lot of activists that were fighting against the big chemical corporations and a lot of these big corporations were spraying an immense amount of pesticides, doing GMO corn seed testing, um, especially in, you know, low income native Hawaiian areas, the big environmental justice issue. And, you know, we saw there's just a lot, a lot of cancers and uh, birth defects popping up um, all over Hawaii, especially in Kauai and um, parts of Maui and Molokai. So this was something that we got really interested in. And uh, then I went on in college to study food systems. And it was there at UC Berkeley. I was lucky enough to get to take a class called Edible Education. And that class brought in food systems change makers from chefs, farmers, you know, nonprofit leaders, teachers, all kinds of activists. And I realized, you know, you don't have to just be a farmer or a chef to be a change maker in the food system. There were so many people working in creative ways to make healthy food more affordable and accessible for their communities. And so um, around the same time, I became a vegetarian uh, and then later vegan. My, my brother became vegan. And then my mom kind of pivoted from vegetarian to vegan. So it kind of all happened for us at the same time. And so my mom was experimenting back home when I was in college with uh, vegan recipes and, you know, making brownies out of black beans and avocado and uh, <laughs> mac and cheese with potatoes and nutritional yeast and <laughs> carrots and onions and just making a lot of really creative recipes that we would give to family and friends and had really um, good responses. And so these meals paired with all these stories that I was hearing from my classes about food systems really got us thinking just more about the food system. And then we took a trip first to Cuba and we got to visit a bunch of organic farms there. And then we went, uh, my, my mom and I organized to, from California to Oregon. We took a road trip. We visited 20 organic farms and interviewed the farmers and just asked, you know, how are you doing these practices organically? Is it actually organic? You know, how do you treat your workers? How do you treat your animals? And so, uh, yeah, we were just lucky enough to get to experience all of that and meet amazing people. And so uh, then one day I was sitting around with my siblings and we thought, hey, maybe I should write a book. You know, we have all of these awesome recipes. And at this point, I've, I've gotten to build relationships with all of these different food systems leaders. 
you know, what if we combine that? Because there, there are a lot of vegan cookbooks out there, but not necessarily any that really talk about other issues in our food system, soil health, the farm bill, animal welfare, you know, workers being exposed to pesticides. And we wanted to make sure that people who loved food were also getting exposed to this knowledge because it's, it's, there's so many aspects of a healthy food system. It's not just about buying healthy food for yourself, but it's about, you know, engaging as a, as an active citizen to make change and help make food, you know, healthy food accessible for everyone. So that was really the, the origin of the book. That's great. No. So I want to kind of pop up into, I know you guys had talked about how you were very active in the food system. And I know Kathy had tried to run for an office. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that was, um, (laughs) it was a interesting time. It was, it happened very fast where we have a, you know, just working with grassroots communities in Hawaii, we just met a lot of really amazing people. One of them is Amy Peruso, who is the Wahiwa um, state legislature rep. And um, she was pa- she was trying to pass some bills blocking pesticides from um, creating like a buffer zone where they couldn't spray by schools and hospitals. And her bills were getting blocked and we were really concerned. And uh, the chair of the ad committee was the uh, the representative in my district. And we were thinking the only way to really make a change is to run against him because really nobody does run against him. And he's been there for nine, now it's 11 years. So we thought, well, if we could find someone to run against him, let's do it. And we couldn't. So I said, all right, I'll run against him, even though I had no experience, but it was all based on environmental issues. We just felt that we need to get bills passed. And if somebody's blocking bills, we need to address that. So I gave it my best effort. It was kind of, I got into the race kind of late and I just walked the precinct, talked to people uh, about environmental issues, what's bothering them. And I was really pleasantly surprised to hear that everyone is concerned about environmental issues, um, whether it's the ocean, the microplastics, the the spraying that goes on on the West side, which affects everybody, which, which affects all our food. And uh, it was a great experience. Although I lost, he was taken off the ad committee as the chair. So it was a victory for me. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people don't realize there's so much spraying that goes on. So who is doing the spraying? Is it all the local farmers that aren't organic? A little bit from the the local farmers so the spring that that i was talking about a lot of those so those were um you know these big agricultural uh testing sites where they were testing gmo corn um the big you know monsanto bayer syngenta dow dupont they have kind of different names um they they kind of form these conglomerates and have different names so it's kind of hard to identify um which companies they are but they're all part of those larger companies a lot of those testing sites have since moved. Like, uh, fortunately, they've they've moved, but unfortunately, they just go to other places like Puerto Rico and do the testing there. But this this the spring that's happening on the west side, a lot of that is um, still like Dole plantation. Um, there are some from the like local big ag, um, like the Sugarland. Um, who else, Mom? Are the folks spraying over there? Um, you know, it could. It's sometimes it's small farms. Sometimes it's uh, it's larger scale, and uh, it's it's not the the information isn't really widespread. We it's very hard to find out who is spraying and what companies are spraying. And even as Mackenzie said, the testing sites we couldn't even find out where the testing sites are. It's very closed information, which is disturbing. Um, but it's also alarming that that's going on and people don't know about it and people a, are affected. A lot affected. of it also too is like Turtle Bay. Um, and and wow. they were, they were seeing, uh, there were testimonies just from people who have animals near Turtle Bay and like horses were dying and oh they realized God. it was probably from all the spring that's happening at Turtle Bay. Mm-hmm. 
So where is spray spraying happening at the golf course or where on? Yeah, the- I got yeah the golf course uh, just on to the make resort. the grass look nice or something. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. It's all aesthetics. It's not for food. It's just to make it you know less weeds. There are yeah. quite a few golf courses here. I'll tell you that. Like on the west side, there's a ton of them. You know, you you really exactly. have to be careful, and that's what my my nonprofit. I I run this nonprofit called Rewild Your Campus, and we work with schools to eliminate pesticides. And, you know, you don't think that they're spraying toxic, you know, cancer causing, reproductive harming, um, you know, neurological damaging uh, pesticides on uh, on your college campus where you're laying on the grass. But the reality is majority of campuses, they are as well as public parks and, you know, really anywhere that has grass. And so you really do have to ask those questions in, in terms of the spraying happening in Hawaii, like, Papa Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action is a good resource. So if you check them out, they they are trying to uncover that information now. And they're an awesome organization that's doing work mm-hmm. around this in Hawaii. That's great. How about the uh, GMO papaya in Hawaii and the other crops in Ho- Hawaii that are GMO? Can you guys talk a little bit about that? You know, that's probably what got us really interested in the agriculture in Hawaii is when we found out years ago in uh, Mackenzie was in high school, we found out that when papayas did come back to the markets and they were reasonably priced, I was, I was so happy to see them return after the hiatus, after they had, uh, you know, a lot of the, the they, they was, virus. Yeah. And we found out that they were all GMO papayas and nobody really talked about that. And I was just shocked because how much do we really know about gen- genetically modified, you know, food. So I did a lot of research and I I thought, I really don't want to eat anything that's GMO. So, uh, you know, luckily down to earth and the papayas at Whole Foods are from organic farms. But even then it's hard to, uh, for farmers to grow organic papayas when there's so much drift and GMO seeds are drifting everywhere. So it's hard to really know. Um, Some are certified organic. I guess my stance on that is, you know, I'm going to choose an organic papaya over a a GMO papaya because the reality is just long term, we don't we don't know what that's doing. And for the papaya in particular, it's uh, they're they're engineered to resist the papaya ring spot virus. Um, And they say, you know, if they hadn't done that, the majority of papayas would have been wiped out. I mean, there are organic papayas still in Hawaii, so it is possible um, but I think the other concern is just, yeah, you know, it, it's kind of like an experiment where if you save the seeds from a GMO papaya that you buy and you plant them, then is there a GMO papaya now growing and, and these get into the environment and, and we don't, it's kind of like the GMO salmon, you know, it's how can we control these um, or can they be controlled? So, but, but I think also when the focus is too much on that, when it comes to GMOs in Hawaii, it's, it's, almost feels like a distraction because to me, the real problem with GMOs across the country and across the globe is the fact that majority of GMOs are used to be resistant to pesticides, whether that's Roundup Ready corn, um, uh, you know, or soybeans. And so when people, when it, it, when people focus too much on the papaya or they talk about golden rice, you know, which has never actually reached the market, um, I like to always say, well, let's look at what is, what is over 90% of GMOs actually being used for it's uh, probably higher, probably closer to 95 or 99%. It's to be resistant to pesticides. And so right. you can't you can't separate the GMO issue with the pesticide issue. And coincidence, the same companies that sell the GMO seeds are the same ones that are making the chemicals and, you know, and prohibits farmers from saving seeds, which is a tradition that people have been doing for thousands of years. So mm-hmm. uh, to me, I kind of always like to pivot back to, to that central focus when we're talking about GMOs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of, people who are just like my next door neighbors, for instance, I hate to give them away, but they're also just spraying just as local people, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people, they just want their lawn to look nice. And the only way to accomplish it, they think the only way to accomplish it, to have it look perfect is to spray Monsanto all over their lawn. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who I guess need to be educated. So a lot um, of glyphosate in our, in our communities, you know, just from your neighbors, you know, 
But it's yeah. funny, whenever I do get together with Kenzie, um, we find people spraying. Like if we go for a run, she'll say, look, they're spraying over there. <laughs> and I, I, she can spot people out so quickly. And some people aren't even wearing a mask or gloves or anything. And I don't think, you know, this, the, the Roundup they sell at Home Depot, people don't realize how dangerous it is. And yeah. Kenzie tried to get it out of Home Depot, and it was a huge huge issue and we couldn't you know well they they said that they would uh bayer said they would remove it from home and garden stores by 2023 but it's uh they they still haven't and i think you know they're just going to reformulate it with something else just as toxic not to be a downer but i think you yeah, know yeah. it's really more about pushing for more organic options and yeah i don't think people you know there's no cancer warning on the label people don't know people yeah. don't know well, um, I do want to talk a little bit about your book. So it's not just a cookbook with great recipes. You also talk about different people in your book. So would you say there's like uh, one person that, I don't know, I'll, I'll start with you, Mackenzie, like who would be your biggest hero in the book? And then we can go on to Kathy's biggest hero in the book. Oh my gosh, that is a hard one. Um, I guess someone who's top of mind for me right now is Jose Andres. He's uh second to the right on the front cover um he's been in the news a lot recently he runs an organization called world central kitchen and they go anywhere in the world where there's you know a, a disaster happening and most recently a war and they just feed people and um you might have heard in the news i think seven members of his of his team died um in palestine that were um bombed by the Israeli military, which was really, really sad. And Jose has been really vocal about that. And and uh his he's just an amazing person who's just passionate about getting food out to people, you know, regardless of of you know, race or religion or or, you know, how hard it is to 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 get to these places. He finds a way and is just a super inspiring and also just a super charismatic person. And so we were really honored to get to interview him. Um, when I was messaging him about which picture do you want for the front cover, uh, he's like, I'm in Poland, like feeding people in Ukraine. Can, <laughs> can I, you know, give you, can I get a little more time to figure this out? And I'm like, of course. And so he, he's also, he's a chef, um, super inspiring. And uh, yeah, um, but pretty much everyone has an amazing story like that. So Everybody. I'll pass it over to you. I don't know who you want it. Gosh, I mean, Gail Myers, we interviewed her and she made a film about, about uh, black farmers and how the struggle to keep their farms going and how uh, so many black farmers have, have lost their land. And it's it's called Rhythm of the Land. It's a beautiful film. But I would, do have to say that uh, one of the most inspirational interviews is Stephen Luenda, Dr. Stephen Luenda, who is a medical doctor and he prescribes food. And, you know, for, for illnesses, to cure things. And he's prevented so many people from, you know, losing their legs from diabetes to uh, heart disease. And uh, he just talks about food. He teaches people how to eat the correct foods. And that's something our doctors haven't been taught in medical school. Crazy enough as it seems. I mean, we eat three times a day, but um, when we do get sick, we turn to medication, whereas he's turning to food to cure diseases. And I just, I just love that concept. You know, I thought, I think it's a really powerful thing to do to change someone's diet. Yeah. Most of the chronic diseases we have, I agree, are due to what we're eating, what we're mm -hmm. putting in our body and our lifestyle. Um, I'll say, do you guys, uh, have you guys submitted testimony? There's a new bill uh, supporting a plant-based lifestyle. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh, I've, cool. Um, yeah. yeah. It's encouraging no. plant-based, um, you know, meals to be offered in schools. There's some people on Kauai spearheading it, um, like a plant-based, I think she's a psychiatrist in Kauai mm -hmm. spearheading it. And they're trying to get the legislator to, you know, in our, of our state to kind of support plant-based know lifestyle i guess that's wow. great yeah grace please yeah. send send that yeah, I'll send you the, I'll over. the link yeah so um, they i think this testimony is due by tomorrow okay um, but, um very interesting we'll definitely uh, do that, that and might have to feature her in our next book yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there's another book coming as well 
We're working on it. We have so wow. many amazing people. We, we, we talk about interview. it. It's very <laughs> early. I, I This one took six years. I can't think about a second book, but my mom already has half the recipes ready. So, Well, I'm not a culinary chef by all means, but I did uh, work really hard in the kitchen trying to create um, plant-based recipes for comfort foods. And I learned so much over the six years that it took us to write the book that during that time, I found you know, a ton of other recipes I want to feature, but, uh, so I keep saving them for our next edition. <laughs> That's a good idea. So what's your favorite recipe or your go-to? Kenzie, you go oh. first. I love the mac and cheese. I, I just, I've always loved mac and cheese, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're vegan or you cook vegan, you know, that nutritional yeast is a great way to kind of get that cheesy flavor again. And so this one has carrots, it has sweet potato, onion, um, you know, Yukon gold potato. So it has, you know, obviously so much more nutritious than normal mac and cheese. And then we have bacon, coconut bacon, mm -hmm. both a sweet or a savory that you can put on top. And it's really tasty. Um, and then I also love, I think you're probably going to say this too, mom, but I love the tahini banana bread. I just made it the other day for some friends. And oh my God. Always comes out great. Uh, and you know, the recipes are pretty simple. Like my mom said, we're not trained chefs, so we don't want to make anything that's not, that's, you know, too difficult for people. Um, so especially once you buy a lot of these ingredients, we, we, and it's also a gluten-free book. So a lot of the, we call for a lot of the same flowers and different ingredients throughout the book. I so, love the sweet potato enchiladas. I'm, mm -hmm. I keep making that oh, like gosh. once every week. I just love it. Kenzie just made it recently and yeah, it's just something that just tastes so good. And it's all, you know, just, just really good ingredients, very clean and just tastes amazing. Um, one of the most popular recipes in the book, which, uh, we were kind of surprised is the mom's morning water or yeah, it's called, it's the first recipe in the book actually, but it's just a ritual that I've developed throughout the years of just drinking um, a, a tea made of lemons and um, turmeric, ginger and mint with water. And I make these ice cubes and I freeze them. I blend it all together. And then every morning I just have, Kenzie does it too. We just have a cube with hot water and add some pepper you know, to activate the turmeric and drink that every morning. And it just, everybody loves it because it just makes you feel so good. You know, it's just a good, good routine to get into is making that lemon water. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Lemon water is great. So what are you guys working on when you are not working on your next book is the question. <laughs> so I run my organization, Rewild Your Campus. And then I'm also just about to finish a master's. I'm at University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. So I graduate in May with a master's in agroecology. So I'm working with farmers who are cover cropping. So I'm I'm really passionate about um, figuring out, yeah, how how can we have a more sustainable food system? And you know, bringing in these farmers who farm thousands of acres and use lots of pesticides, you know we can't leave them out of the conversation because the reality is they own the mo majority of land in this country. And that's where the most, you know, pesticides are being used. So trying to work with them to come up with solutions. So that's been a really fun experience. And, and then, yeah, really trying to expand the, the nonprofit. And then when I have time, I, I love, I love cooking and it's been really fun to cook from the book. Um, it's kind of a surreal experience that me and my mom have been imagining for years. And so that's, that's been really, really fun. Ever since we wrote the book, we've been doing a lot of traveling and talking about the book. We've got on a lot of, uh, you know, we've gone to like a lot of places to do book talks. And we just got back from Mexico, which was amazing. Wow. We did a whole week there of talking about our book and, uh, you know, showing people the book, which is really great. And then, like I said, I'm really, I'm always thinking of new recipes and trying to you know, just recreate some really good comfort foods from the next book I really would like to do would be more international and create more uh, recipes from different parts of the world and interview people from different parts of the world. So I'm always thinking about that. That's great. So do you guys have, uh, you know, in your own place that you live, do you guys like to grow vegetables too? Is that 
how you became interested in the pesticides, you know, or? Well, what I like to do is we do have a vegetable garden at, in, at our home in Hawaii, but um, I really like to support the farmers that grow, uh, that grow yeah. their crops organically, or it doesn't have to be certified, but as long as they're not using pesticides and herbicides. And I go to the farmer's market every week and I know my farmers and I know Ma'o Farms is amazing. And there's a lot of really good farmers that, um, that do not believe in spring and they, they go out of their way to, you know, grow organic food. And I really love to support them for most of my veggies. Yeah, yeah. it definitely is important to talk to them. And I mean, I, I don't have much space here and even, uh, yeah, in our, in our house in Hawaii, we're on a slope so there's not a lot of flat space to grow food but I would say you know I always am growing a little something in a raised bed here and I think it's important for everyone even if you just have a single pot to just plant a seed because it changes you it's a it's an amazing Mm -hmm. experience it is it's a miracle really to to plant a seed and watch it grow and I think even if you're doing that in small ways you, you automatically become more mindful you you appreciate how much work it takes to grow food, even if you're doing it on a small scale. So I definitely encourage it, even if you don't have much space at all, even just an indoor pot to grow a tomato or something. Do you guys have any takeaways for our viewers? Um, my takeaway is go to the farmer's market and meet your growers and talk to them and talk about what, what, you know, what the season, what they're growing and um, get to know where your food comes from. And my takeaway is, yeah, be, become an active citizen, you know, and, and engage in these bills. I would go to the Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action website, HAPA, and they they provide, you know, a template for how you can engage in testimony um, to support more local sustainable farmers, healthier meals in schools, um, the, the buffer zones like we're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it's not enough to just vote with your fork, right? We got to we got to vote with our vote and become active citizens in this process. Well, thank you so much. We have to wrap it up. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on Think Tech Hawaii. We've been talking with the authors of Brown Bakers, Kathy and Mackenzie Feld. If you enjoyed the coverage and conversation, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel, youtube.com slash Think Tech Hawaii for more great content on Think Tech. See you in two weeks for our very last recording on Think Tech. My guests will be Kip Praisman of Floralia. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com or Graceful Living at Graceful Living 365 for more information on Instagram. Thanks so much for watching. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.